Vito, how's everybody doing? Welcome to the Beat 139, I'm Callie. Okay, so we want to welcome our first guest for tonight. You know, tonight is a real messy evening, but everybody having to get in and show up, so we're going to have a good show tonight, right? So she's a South Bronx native, native radio talk show host, activist, community leader. So this is a powerful lady right here. Public speaker and CEO and founder of Street Corners Resources a non-for-profit organization aimed at eliminating guns and street violence since 2007. We have Aisha Sekou here. Welcome, Aisha. Thank you. Thank you. So you born in South Bronx, huh? Yes, but one thing you left out. What I left out? I'm a uh, mother, grandmother, and great-grandmother. There it is, there, let's talk about that. I don't know that, but I know that. The government's for you, so I don't know. Anyway, tell everybody where you're from and uh, um, I grew yourself. up I grew up in the Bronx. Um uh, 169, 168th Street and Webster Avenue, that's right, the VA. Oh, uh and then later moved to 188th and Washington Avenue. Okay. And uh and from there I went to college uh at about seventeen years old. And so I lived in Florida for about eleven years where I finished uh at Bethune Cookman College. I actually went to Florida A and M mm -hmm. and then uh married and Went to Bethune Cookman College and finished from there, and then somehow I wound back up in New York <laughs> and uh, did some some study at uh, Fordham University, and so I have yet to complete a master's, but that's that's in the works. Some <laughs> I think I already earned that, mm -hmm. and I have one daughter. She's um, grown with our own children. Mm -hmm. I'm not gonna say our age because she's gonna say like, "Mom, you tell yours. You don't have to, you don't have to tell mine." Don't tell mine. And uh, and I have a grandson that's 22. I can say that. Mm -hmm. And he's uh, he plays bas um, he played basketball for a good while down in Jacksonville, but he uh, his love is football, and he's at a Division One school. Mm -hmm. um, you know, slave to football, but uh, you know, paid for his is paying for his education, so he graduates wow. uh, this this coming. Uh, June, not mm -hmm. this June, next June, right. he graduates. So I'm really proud of that. And then I have some small grandchildren. Uh, a on roll, I gotta say that. Akila, mm -hmm. I'm very proud of her. Okay. She reads way above grade level, and I'm glad to see her with a real oh, book a in her hand. Yeah, yeah, she keeps yeah. a real book in her hand. Right. You know what I mean? And she's an advocate for peace, so I love that she always talks. Following grandma. Yeah, there you go. That's what I'm saying. You know? Following grandma steps. Yeah. Positive. Positive so, yeah, so that's, uh, and then I have a, a, a little grandson named Amir, and uh, he's a superhero, doing very, very well in school, mm -hmm. and learning to uh, behave properly, so that's still a little struggle every now and then, he mm -hmm. takes that after me, <laughs> and he don't always follow the rules, and, um, and then my great-grandson is uh, just made two, he's in Texas, and he's very intelligent, and I think mm -hmm. that those things, and I'm not just saying that because they're my grandchildren, I think that early on we don't acknowledge the intelligence that mm -hmm. we see in our children, right. and so we kind of take it like, okay, we have to keep showing them and telling them and raising them when actually they're showing and telling us a whole lot, right. and we have to sometimes follow the order that they come to this earth with, which is very different than our learned behavior, mm -hmm. where we lose that kind of order, you know what I mean? Yeah. Like there are some things that kids come with that's deep, if we just follow them. Mm -hmm. When I think about the, um, the issue of violence, and I go you know, and sit in the park and I just watch how kids play, and I always ask people, watch how kids play. They fight, and they fight over the ball, and then somebody get it, and they run, and then they start playing again, and then next thing you know, they're on the sliding board, and they work it all out. It's they do their own conflict resolution. Mm -hmm. And somewhere we lose the ability to see past the issue of you know the little violent or mad thing. We can't see that, but kids see that, and they be like, it's about playing ball, it ain't about being mad. Right. Right? It's about getting on the sliding board. So I know it sounds kind of um, elementary, but we, there's a lot to be learned from children. Right. And so I spend a lot of time observing them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But that's but, grandma stuff. But it's not just <laughs> elementary, it's, it's, it's real life. Mm. 
Mm. You know, it's the teachings that your parents gave to you mm. and you give it to to your offsprings. Absolutely. And then just to watch them and see how, you know, they move mm. according to how you raise them. Mm. You know, and like you said, kids, they find a way to work things out. You know, they go through their little quarrels and they go back and play again. Mm -hmm. But the way things is going on in society now is like, oh, it's very different. It's and, quite different. Mm -hmm. and, and not only that, you're never too young to teach, you know? It's it can be all ages. You can always learn as long as you're open to, you know? No, absolutely, Queen. Learning is lifelong. And if we remember absolutely. that every single day is an opportunity to fill your vessel, mm -hmm. right? Who you oh, are, yeah. your being. And... Um, Sometimes because we think we get to a place of knowing it all that we avoid uh, the opportunities for, wis for the, to receive wisdom mm -hmm. from right. whether it's our babies, our teenagers. Sometimes the kids that they say, oh, those bad kids, you know, I have <laughs> friends who um, talk about my work and they reference the young people that I work with as those bad kids. Or you always in, with the thugs in tow. And I've learned so much from just hearing their thoughts, thoughts that are often dismissed. Mm -hmm. And I think with the age group that we deal with, we um, in my organization, Street Corner Resources, um, we have a Cure Violence contract where the 18th recipient in the city of Cure Violence, although we were doing anti-violence work long, well before that, more than uh, 10, 10 years before receiving this contract. But um, one of the things um, we're challenged with is working with those who are at the highest risk of shooting. And uh, and people say, well, what do those kids look like? They look like your son or your daughter. Right. And putting in, put in a certain kind of situation. And the deep thing is, is that if we take more time to listen to them, we could stop the trigger from being pulled. Mm. So one of the things I say is that the trigger is pulled long before the trigger is pulled because there are things that are happening with our young people that we dismiss. We don't hear them. We don't even, we begin to not see them in our own house. It's like, just go in the room and close the door and play that game. And they play that game all night, every day, the next day. They go to school, they fall asleep, they come back, they get the honey bun, get the coffee, go in the room, play the game all day, all night. Which means that the brain is being trained to shoot. Hmm. Right. So how do you not do something that you've learned and, and trained yourself to do? Like some things are just natural. You know, I talked all my life, so it's easy. Somebody say, hey, here's a microphone. I talk, <laughs> right? But then somebody puts a kid in front of a gun after he's been shooting all day and all night. He shoots. It's not, no, I shouldn't do this. It's, no, this feels natural to me because I've been playing killing games. Mm -hmm. So when we talk about the issue of violence, we have to look at what have we created in this society and in our households with our children. It makes us, some parents... Um, relieved that they, they don't have to worry about the kid. He's in the room. Well, you don't have to worry about him right now. You have to worry about him after he pulled the trigger or when you have to bury him because somebody else who plays the game pulled the trigger. And people might say that's not true. The video games, the war games that we see came out of the military. There's a man, I can't remember his name, is uh, Dr. Goss or Gross, uh, and he talks about the use of uh, video games, killing games, when people would go into the military and could not shoot, they would get paralyzed in the middle of, of combat. And so they would take them and, and house them into a room, right, a, a, a decent sized room like a classroom, and you play killing games all day, all day, all day, and it desensitizes the brain. And you accept the fact that there's death and blood and gore and that you have to be the one to create that. And so there you go, thereby you have the killer and you put him back on the field and he does okay. So that's the same game. Call of Duty and others are, are, are crafted off of these killing games. And so we're asking our kids to go in a room and play them all day, all night. Just don't bother me. Eat chicken wings and fried rice. And they eat a diet of sugar-filled foods, including rice. And we wonder why they can't think and they can't act because the brain is fogged and it's prepared to kill. So the violence that we see, um, you know, a lot of it now is generated from that place. Back in the day, I, I'm 61. Back in the day, I mean, people was doing a whole lot of things in the neighborhood, but they took care of the kids. They took care, you know, grandma and auntie. They were taking care. You didn't just call them that. You put some money in their hand. You made sure that they ate. They fed the neighborhood. You didn't, you didn't, you know, it where you sleep. That means you didn't do business where you live. Your children did not see you dealing drugs and 
beating up women and all that. That was a rarity mm -hmm. when somebody got shot. It was a big deal. Mm -hmm. Now it's like there's no, you know, it's 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 just a, a disconnect in our community in terms of what who people are and what they would do. Yeah. It's, it's it's crazy. But anyway, I'm blessed to be here. Thank I you. I gotta agree with you because. And I have sons, and, and be honest with you, you know, the most popular games is the violent games. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I mean, when I came up playing, I played video games coming up, I played sports. Mm -hmm. I like the basketball and the, and the baseball mm -hmm. and, the, and stuff like that, you know. Right. But these games I see now, and they got all kind of changing weapons and knives, and, mm -hmm. and, and it's, it's like all violence, and that's what they get off on, too. Now they got us, it's so bad. Now you don't have to be in the house playing with them. No, you can, you can play, play from, uh, you could be in Chicago and I'm in New York and we going against each other. And you could talk to each other. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I had a, a young man that I was going to provide um, my house and my myself as a foster mother temporarily until they found because somebody had him and they had to move. And they said, well, you know, he knows you, he's familiar with you, take care. So I said, okay, you know, my daughter's grown and everything. So he stays with me while they are looking for a, another home for him. And so I fell asleep on the couch like I always do. And the computer's in uh, the dining room. And he's in there with the box hooked up to the computer or whatever, however they do it. And I'm hearing people talk, shoot him, shoot him, shoot him in the head. He's turning the corner, shoot him in the head. Like, I could not, I thought somebody was in my house. <laughs> I'm like, what the hell? He was playing killing games. And um, I think it was the first uh, version of Call of Duty where you can talk to each other and they can guide you mm -hmm. in, in terms of what to do. And that's when I first really, really realized, like, this is a sick thing. And the thing is, is he was having a breakdown because I cut the cord on the game. Oh, yeah. Like, really, I'm talking about a real breakdown. Because that really is something to be careful. You know, you have pervs also <coughs> getting through on when kids is playing like that, mm -hmm. telling kids, selling kids some... I, it was actually something that really happened. Um, it was a kid, a child playing the game, and it was an older. They say it was a man in his sixties. Mm. Um, he was talking to the child and acting like he went to school with him, and he was like a teacher. Knew him. And mm -hmm. you know, his mom was listening outside the door, so she said she thought she was she thought she was bugging because she's like, okay, it's the middle of the night. You know, he can't just be in here talking on the phone. He's supposed to be asleep. Mm -hmm. This man is talking to this little boy on the phone through the game. That's how they do. You know, and yeah. this is how they this is how they trapping kids. They acting like they're the friends, the school teachers. They meeting up with kids and they are kidnapping the children. Exactly. This is what's happening. Right. It's crazy. And, 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 and it's not just boys. So I'm yeah, I'm glad right. that you but said that. Definitely both sectors. Yeah. Well, and and the other part of that is that you know when we don't provide the oversight. Like, my mama provided real oversight. Mm -hmm. You got your butt whipped. You had to be in a certain time. You had to do chores. Um, you had to go help Miss Mamie with her groceries or whatever it was. You know, there were things for you to do. On Saturday, you didn't just run outside. You didn't stay up all night. And so now, parents, uh, some, I'm not going to say all, some have um, digressed from providing oversight, meaning to oversee their own children. If you don't oversee your household, or your child, somebody else will guarantee. Bro, they're on guarantee. the phone all day, mm -hmm. watching TV all day, where they're not feeding the mind at all. And you're right, because parents should let the child just be. Because nowadays it's about Wi-Fi. Mm -hmm. Kids starting from like age two and up, you see them on the phones, just concentrating on phones. Like mm -hmm. it's amazing, but it's it's amazing at the same time. It still takes away from the ch a child being a child and playing and getting to know things that they should know instead of just the phone and music and. You know? Then not only that, um, the video games have become the new babysitter. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right, yep. that's exactly you know right. what I'm right. saying. Right. They become the new babysitter, like yep. like you said. You know, you get them a game, whatever. Go play the game. Mm -hmm. They go in their room. <laughs> it's encouraged. Mm -hmm. You know, I could just chill out for a couple hours. My, I know my kids in the house, and he in there playing Call of Duty and playing them other karate games. You got Rambo games. in the room. You got and, Rambo. And, <laughs> kids turn into yeah, Rambo. See, when I grew up playing video games, we got points. <laughs> we were scoring stuff. Right. You know, we we was we we had them. You get a certain amount of points and go ching, 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 you feel right. good. They got screens they got to go through. And each screen, you got to tear something down and get to the next screen. Mm -hmm. You know, and it, it is violent. But that's the most popular game. Like, but a lot of the most popular TV shows and movies are violent. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about that. Well, you know, I was having that same conversation with my mother. We, um, sometime on Sunday, I go over to the house and we watch movies, which is something I never really do. I never get a chance to, like, really sit down and 
They say I'm gonna watch TV. I'm not a big TV fan. But recently, my mother had been sick, so I said, well, this is a way to spend some time with her, talk with her, and stuff like that. And we were looking at the different offerings on Netflix. Mm -hmm. And um, there are a lot of very violent films on, I'm telling you, because we had to keep going through them. I said, Mom, I don't want to watch nothing violent. This is my work. I don't want to do that. And it's either violence against women, where they're cutting them up and putting them in bags and dragging them into the woods, or people killing each other, or war, war uh, violence. I mean, just, you know, you can peruse yourself and see that there is an enormous amount of violence on television. Mm -hmm. So I think, um, just to bring it back to the work, I think um, we have to be more conscious about our, our food, our mental food and spiritual food. And we used to be more conscious as a people than almost anybody on this planet. Yeah, sure. People would come to us to get fed. They come to our church. And when I say get fed, I'm not talking about food fed. I'm talking about again, mentally, yeah. mentally and spiritually. And so you would see people coming to the churches and just wanting to be around us because of the energy that we carry. And it's a different kind of energy. We would guard that energy. And now um, our children are left unguarded. And they don't know about that. They didn't learn about how to guard yourself and not consume everything. Now, everything is consumed through Instagram and Facebook mm -hmm. and social all the media, different yeah. social yeah. medias <laughs> and this whole envy kind of thing. Well, you know, she got 100% hair. I don't have that. You know, we gonna jump her. It's like, it's insane. With If you see how the girls mm. are acting now, um, as a matter of fact, um, last week, right? Mm. We had, um, a, a, a thing with some girls. It was a whole bunch of them, a whole bunch of girls. And they weren't all American, but they were black, mm -hmm. right? And they were all looking to fight each other. They had just stomped the girl out. And a lot of it has to do with you think you cute, I'm dark skin, you light skin, you got eyelashes. Is this on Yep. I was you there. Know. You know. I was there. And so I, I had been following them. So I started with them on 138th and Fifth Avenue, and then we were breaking them up. I'm not even gonna tell you what they said to me, because I had to remember that I'm somebody great grandmother. <laughs> that squeaky is not, you I'm, know. I left right before starting. Yeah, well, it got yeah. real ugly. But yeah. but the thing is, is that even some of them come from immigrant immigrant parents that mm -hmm. come here and work very hard and open up shops and their vendors on 125th Street. They pray at the mosque. But you know what? When you don't provide oversight for your children, somebody will. So whoever is teaching them about this, what well, is this culture of fighting and, and, and jumping and beating and stomping, they are taking that on too. So it's not just African-American boys or girls or Latino boys and girls. It is the culture of young people now to In fight mm -hmm. and bring violence to each other. That is like the, the, the way. It is becoming the way. For them, and so somewhere we need to interrupt that mindset. So, uh, what's the makeup of your, your team? I see a lot of y'all be out there, and I'm like, there's a couple members I know mm -hmm. on your team, and I'm like, wow, that's good that they're doing good things. Yeah, I so love So, can it. you um, explain to the people about the a little team? more about your organization, your okay. team, and, and when you started hmm. the organization? I guess you can start from when you started, okay, and your vision, and you hiring. Um, these young people and so all right so um it this work for me working and giving service in the community really started before i knew that that's what it was you know i come from an activist household my mother was a black panther my mother was very involved um in the community she was an activist all my life that's all i knew so i thought it was what everybody else did mm -hmm. i didn't know that it was something different mm -hmm. right like everybody didn't do that i thought everybody protested stuff, went to Washington, D.C. You know, uh, at that time, welfare was uh, being protested a lot because of some of the things that they did, uh, particularly with single black women, uh, about where's the man and all of that, why you got three toothbrushes, you're only supposed to have two, all of that. So my mother did a lot of protests around that, and she started um, an organization herself. And um, I guess, you know, some of that came natural. So anyway, somewhere in, in the doing of this work, um, somebody told me I was an activist. I said, I'm not an activist. Mm -hmm. And they said, yes, you are. And I said, no, I'm not an activist. And then my mother said, yes, you are. Mm -hmm. She said, I said, no, everybody's somebody. She said, 
my mother calls me squeaky, that's my nickname. She says, squeaky, everybody doesn't do this. It takes a lot to do this. And so now I, so then I realized that what I was doing was different. And then the things in my mind that I saw that I didn't like and I wanted to change, I was always taught if you don't like something, then you set out to make it different. And, um, you know, that's kind of like the thing that was ingrained in me from my, from my mother. And she still says the same thing. I was at a protest. And I didn't like that when, those, when they shot those two guys on 145th Street coming across that bridge when all them babies and stuff was out there. You remember that? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then they had a press conference and, you know, and I saw all of the blood caked up on the ground and everything. And one particular person was saying, oh, yeah, um, you know, this is our fault. This is our fault. Like blaming the community. And I sat, stood through the press conference while well, she said that. And my mother, I told my mother, I said, I don't feel right about it. She said, you don't feel right about it because you ain't say nothing about it. You mm -hmm. let it go. So my activism put me in this work. Oh, so from that day, you decided right then that's what you wanted to have your own. Well, no. I started an organization before then. But what that day made me really think about who I am in this work. So you can start something and then you think that you're doing one thing and then you get introduced to yourself. Mm. See, the introduction to self happens along the way. Right. So we started, uh, I wrote my, um, and I was speaking to myself in plural, we is really me. I started writing the 501c3 in 2005. Uh, before that, I ran welfare and work programs. I'm an educator by first profession. I taught adult ed, English as second language, GED, and other subjects. But I knew that young people always came to my house. I lived on 136th Street in the Brownstone. We had four floors there. And my house was always full of kids, although I had only birthed one. So, so I was always commissioned to do something with young people. So I started the organization in 2005. Street, street, street Corner, corner Resources. Right. And then we got the 501c3 in 2007. They kept sending it back. It's a process. It was more of a process then um, than it probably is now. They probably have shortcuts and all of that. But um, it started, the organization was originally started to bring... Um, education, employment, and training, and other resources to the street, mm -hmm. to those kids that most people would not normally want to serve. So they didn't want to serve Day Day and Bubba and Daquan and then with their hat turned backwards, pants sagging. Mm -hmm. People didn't want them to come up into places. So I wanted to be able to provide services because those are the same kids that would come on my stoop to fill out the summer youth application. Mm -hmm. That's when they had a three or four or five page application and you had to get it in by a certain time. So, you know, that was happening in my house. This stuff was already going. But making it solidified, uh, we applied in 2005 and got our 501c3 in 2007. And I did a lot of work, um, working with young people, you know, trying to provide resources, workshops in public schools and in churches and places like that. But what I found was as we began to serve young people, I began to find, and at the same time, I was running a BEGIN program. BEGIN was BEGIN Employment Gain Independence Now. It was a city welfare to work program mandated by Clinton. And so I ran that program on 12th Street. So most of the people who came through that program came from this area. This was the catchment area. They had to come through uh, that program. And those women that I saw, their sons, mainly sons, were becoming gang involved and some of them were losing life. And I made a decision when they told us that we lost our lease, that I wanted to start something and do something about the violence that I was seeing. And so we just kind of band together. It's just kind of evolved. You know, when you want to start something, or you want to do something, you just have to know, just do it, stay steady, and the help shows up. Like, it's okay, amazing. Like, far as your staff, like, do you put, you put out, like, um, flyers that you're looking for staff? Yeah, or? right now we're looking for three people. I'm glad you said that. Yeah. <laughs> um, I, I mean, I love my team. I have a good, very good, strong team. They're young, they're learning, they're energetic, they're enthusiastic, and I think um, that they have the passion. I know that they have the passion to do this work. And so I don't just need people who know the streets. You know, people say, oh yeah, well, you need to hire this person. They come from the street. One, nobody comes from the street. You come out your mama. That's the first thing. The other thing is, is that the credibility issue is not just how many people you beat up, how many people you shot, you the big homie, you the shot caller, and you didn't lead anybody anywhere better than, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So for me, um, in hiring people, I look for passion in this work, the willingness to want to really help make change. And, and usually we'll have people wait before we hire them, see if they're coming back.
Mm-hmm. You know, they come and try to sit around, hang around. If they stay steady right. and, and, and they uh, show up and they ask for what they want, because you have to be able to ask for what you want. This is work that you have to be a little forward in sometimes. So, you know? yeah, so what's the age group you, look, you um, target as far as the work with you? Well, by law, <laughs> I am an employer. So um, the age is not the most important thing, but I will tell you that this work requires stamina. Mm-hmm. So we are out sometime very late, and oftentimes we canvas and we have to walk, and I don't always walk them with them as much as I used to because that's not my job anymore. My job is to run the organization and, and, and to get more funding and provide more services. But occasionally I'll be like, I'm with y'all, put my sneakers on, my sweatsuit, and we out. Mm-hmm. And not everybody is able to have that kind of stamina. You know, because people look at me and say, how you be out with them? You know, I got friends, they, they lay at home in the bed, you know. But... So this work requires a certain amount of stamina. So I would say it's not for the weak hearted because you got, you got to be able to stomach some things and take a few things and, and fall back in your own personal spirit. So when these kids say some ugly things to you, you have to be able to still talk to them regardless and not get personal and as the kids say, get in your feelings. You know, so it requires a few things. Everybody can't do this work. Mm-hmm. And I, they might want to because people say, Sister Aisha, I want to help you. Oh, you should hire me. That's the wrong reason. One, I'm, I'm good. And when I say that, not that I don't need help, because we always need more money. More money, more money, more money. Because we can do more things. But we also, first of all, need people who are committed to the work. Yeah, you got to put that work in. Yeah. You got to put that work in. Because what you do requires a lot of, um, not just stamina, but a lot of belief. Right. You got to believe, you got to have faith that this program or what you're doing is going to work and is going to help people. And like you say, it doesn't have a time limit on it. No, it doesn't. Yeah, you, so you go I'm home when it's time to go home. Huh, we got to get this done. You know? And I know <laughs> when some of them first started, yeah. and I said, I know y'all want to go home, but you ain't going home. We yeah. right here. Mm-hmm. And they just be looking at me like, <laughs> this is what you signed up for. Because we have some great days. We just came back uh, from Long Beach, California. We went out to Crenshaw, went to the marathon uh, over there near the Nipsey Hustle. Uh, all of the murals, and we talk with folks, and took pictures, and just tried to. How do people them. receive you when you come? Like, you, you know, it's amazing. Up? It's amazing, yeah. right? It's amazing. I just went to the big homies and I said, yeah, "How the king's doing?" Right. Because people will receive you to what you bring to them. Right. You call the brother a king, his shoulders go back. Quick. The head goes <laughs> talking to me, <laughs> and that's exactly what I try to bring. Yeah. When I see sisters, no matter. Where they come from, and how they act, whatever. I call them queen. I get a whole different thing. Yeah. It, you know, it could be the one that, that yeah. everybody's bullying, teasing. Yeah. You say queen, and it'd be like, you know. So there was that kind of mm-hmm. receiving. Right. And even uh, somebody said, well, you just going to go over there and talk to them like that? You know, because they all, you know, camped up in a certain area and everything. I'm not fearful of my own people like that. I'm right. just not. Right. And so any um, area, whether it's in... At the Marathon store in, in, in Crenshaw, or whether we're on 40th Street, or on 125th Street, or on the east side in Carver Houses, or up in the Polo, I talk to young people. Right. Not only do I talk to them, most of them know me, I hug them, and I believe that when you transfer energy through a hug, you reach people's spirit in a way that they can't even control it. Mm-hmm. All that hard rock kind of melt. Right. You know, you can melt hard rock with love. You right. know that, yeah, right? Yeah yeah, 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 yeah. And so what I do is I hug these kids, and I say, how you doing, son? I said, I ain't seen you. You all right? I did that mm-hmm. with a young man this morning. And I said, you've been on my mind. Mm-hmm. I said, you've been on my mind. He said, Miss Aisha, I'm going to come in the office. I promise you. Because yeah. you know, they start wearing, you know, you got a head wrap on. Maybe you can see something. <laughs> that they, you know what I mean? <laughs> and I use it. So, I mean, so young people and approaching them are brothers. It's what we bring to people. Spirit feels spirit. It's almost undeniable. So, Queen, let me ask you. Mm-hmm. As you speaking for your organization, what would you say would been one of the hardest decisions you guys had to uh, make as far as a team coming to um, like something like anything hard? Like, what was one of the hardest decisions you guys had to conquer? There's a lot of them, but for me, one of the hardest things is whether to stay at a crime scene Mm -hmm. or not. Mm -hmm. Like, when do I leave? Because I've been to so many. I've I've seen uh, more young people lose life 
than I want to remember. And so I was on a, um, a hundred and I think it was 130th Street, and a uh, young man was just recently murdered there, Jeremiah. They call him Jay. Mm -hmm. And I actually flew back from Texas early because I was kind of feeling, I don't know, some kind of way. When they, people was calling me and telling me this you know, young man was shot in his head and the way that it went, it, it did something. I said, I got to get out of here. I just mm -hmm. was not comfortable staying where I was and not knowing. So for me, even that day when we, they had a, um, a response over there, like a vigil, and I had to decide, you know, it's time to go. Although people were leaving, people were still talking with the grandmother and the mother. Mm -hmm. And I had to say, I need to go now. Because, you know, it's like, when do you leave? Because you become, like, really enthralled. Involved, yeah. especially Definitely when you care and you love the mm, person. Mm -hmm. And especially as a mother. Mm -hmm. Because you feel something. It's just something different. You think about, this mother got to bury her baby. And one of the things, when somebody says to you, I can't go identify the body because I can't see him or her like that. Mm -hmm. And then it's like, you just want to jump in and say, I'll go with you or... And so some, you have to draw lines because you still have to get up the next day right. and do the work. And um, so sometimes um, in this work, you know, you have to make the decision, do I to stay to preserve myself so that I can help more people? Right. And that's what I have to remember. Because when you witness death, it is trauma. That's trauma. Right. And so as much as other people go through trauma, people who do this work, go through trauma. People who live in neighborhoods where people die every other day, whether you knew them or not, it is trauma. Mm -hmm. Me and this brother mm -hmm. was talking about when um, Ms. Sims was uh, Ms. Odessa, killed. Yeah. Ms. Odessa Sims was killed, and he said he felt it. I, I understand that. Yeah, I, I felt it. That's that. the first time I, I saw you um, in action. Mm. I'm like, oh, she, she's deep. It was and deep. It, it, was, it was sad because um, I was like part of like help organize men. Um, I don't know, you know John Fresh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, because we, we talked through Facebook. I said I have to, I have to do something because right. I was just out there. Right. And I, if there was a nice cookout, it was packed out there. I went home. And I actually, I didn't get home. So right. I got the call and said, start shooting. And then when I found out, you know, a lady got hit with a straight bullet in her yeah. neck. Mm -hmm. The guy shot the kid shot from across the street. Yep. And it, it bothered me. I'm like, damn, I have to do something. It was so I, I, I spoke about it on Facebook. Mm -hmm. And then... Me and John Fresh talked about it. He's like, yo, we come out this day. You know. Right, so y'all went out there and y'all did something. Yeah, I went out there. Right, we did the, the, um, did, um, we did the we, we lead march. by example, yeah, like yeah. a march. Yeah, yeah, he told me about that. I was exhausted, so I wasn't there. But I remember he you was there. You I was there? there? Yeah, you No, speaking. when we did, okay, so then that's, that was an action that we all there. did together. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Because yeah. I remember But he uh, did something else after that. My son, that. yeah, he did something after that. My son was there. Everybody came. Um, I remember because he was in the middle. He was like, this guy to stop. Right. Like, we called that press conference. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But the cops was, the cops was everybody there. Everybody yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 And, and the, the sad thing is, is that those are the memories you have to, ha you know, that you have with people. Like, most of the people I end up meeting, like, by accident. I was parking, trying to, no, trying to move my car through the street, right? And I, so I looked over at the woman, and I said, excuse me. I said, is this your car? She said, yeah. I said, well, can you just, like, pull it over some? And she stopped, like, as if time had stopped. And I'm like, okay, so what's going on here? So she said, I will move my car out of your way. And I'm like, whoa, what's going on? And she said, you were with me when my son was murdered. Mm -hmm. Like, this is how people remember mm -hmm. me. Right. They, oh, you was, the girl told me just the other day, she said, you might not remember me, but you were there um, at my brother's funeral and you spoke. So I don't want to be that person all the time, that that's right. how people remember. Just like how yeah, he said, yeah. you know, I get yeah, this yeah. all the, and I'm not saying that that's bad. I'm grateful yeah. to be present and to do this. And I know that this is the work that I'm supposed to be doing. I know that. I got it. But I'm just saying that the, uh, the, that the kind of killing that we've been seeing Enough is enough. That woman who moved her car, that was in the 90s. Mm -hmm. right. This is what, 2019? Mm -hmm. Get ready to be 20 in a minute? Yeah. That's too long. And if I was doing that with her, I was doing this before that. Right. Mm -hmm. That's too much. Yeah. yeah. Well, she probably noticed you because not, not enough people do it. You know? Well, she so said she that I'm one of the few women yeah, that do this well, work. Yeah. 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 So you're you going to remember somebody. Like so I'm going to know, uh, like, far as your, your team. Do they speak also? Like they also like have their own little um, 
voice and, and speak to the um, public. Yeah, don't think because they still over there quiet. No, I'm, no, I'm not thinking that was accent. Cause... Well, they're out every day. So, um, so and let me let me um, not not talk so much about the 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 death side of it because there are some we do have some um, you know really powerful stories of people reclaiming themselves, mm -hmm. right? And and the, and the work and so on our team. Um, all of them know about the organization and, and, the, and the work that they do and they can speak about the work okay. that they do. Um, each and every one of them, Tone and Josh just came out of training and Aziza and the others that are not present here um, can speak to this work because part of connecting with the community, what we do is we engage, 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 engage. So, um, you know, we're in a lot of places. We're at the community board meeting. Somebody else on my staff that's not on this team, this the street team, uh, is at precinct council meetings. Um, so we are at the public safety meetings. We're involved, we go to other people's events and we make sure that we connect. We have something called uh, Pub Ed. And so the team has to be able to talk about yeah. how do you de-escalate violence? So it can't just be wait for Sister Aisha. That's how it used to be back in the day before we had money to have a team. But now the entire team is trained in uh, talking to people about the de-escalation of violence and looking at um, ways uh, to engage our young people better. So um, yeah, they do, they, they talk about it. And once in a while, uh, I do a radio show, so once in a while the team comes on and kind of keep the community updated. So um, is, it, is it possible, um, it, could, it could be real quick, um, one of your members, I want to ask them what this organization did, organization did for them. Is it possible when anyone yeah, who talk to Aziza. could come? You know? uh, come on, Aziza. I love to come over. All right, go And so, just while she's sitting, I just want to say too that there are some uh, very positive things that we're doing. We two music studios, one at Harlem Renaissance High School, and one right on 140th Street between Seventh and Eighth Avenue, where also our Peace Cafe is housed. In the last Friday of every month, mm -hmm. uh, it is a free community engagement. Young, old, black, white, Indian, Asian can show up to that Peace Cafe um, this Friday. Uh, we'll, we'll be there. And we open up the backyard and throw up the grill and put some things on and we try to remember that some people don't eat meat and we'll throw a few mushrooms on and some burgers and you know, all of that. Sweet some potatoes. corn and sweet potatoes. We go a little country with it, right? Yeah, all the time. And um, so we, we have some great things that are happening that young people are doing. We'll be taking them on a retreat very soon. I'm working on trying to uh, get the approval to take them to Africa. And just so that they have an experience that is uh, different from anything that they ever had. Mm -hmm. So um, we're working on that. We hope that we get a, a yes. <laughs> they, said, they said that uh, sometimes I, I, uh, you know, I'm always way out the box. But, you know, a closed mouth don't get fed. Mm -hmm. And if you don't ask, you won't get. Mm -hmm. And uh, speaking of that, before Aziza says anything, I just want to also say that in, um, sometime during the month of June, we'll be pushing out a mobile unit which when I told you about Street Corner Resources, it was to make education, employment, and training mobily accessible in the community. Mm. And that mobile unit uh, took 10 years to get, and I can't even tell you all the people that I asked for help mm -hmm. um, in getting it. And so we got some just plain old no's and you crazy and we don't need that. And why are we gonna spend that much money when mm. we, we spend to uh, incarcerate one young person is over $250,000 a year. Mm -hmm. So why can't we spend $250,000 in one year for a vehicle that'll last about at least 10, 15 years uh, to move it around the community and save our young people from incarceration? So I have to give a big shout out to Mayor Bill de Blasio for seeing and understanding my vision, State Senator Brian Benjamin for supporting my vision from day one uh, of having a mobile unit, and then all of the other people who said, just hold on, keep shaping it, writing it, when you and it's soon come. Oh no, we got it. Oh, yeah, I went and bought it in March. Right. Yeah. Oh, okay. With the okay. cashier's check. Right. Okay. Pay for it. Ain't no payments, right. nothing. That's great. That's great. That's great. That's great. That's great. tell the people um because it's important what this program the street corner resource done for you since you've been uh, part of this so we'll start when i got hired right so i got information about an open house you know i'm i've always been very community oriented i'm from the bronx but a lot of my friends live in harlem so i've always cared about what goes around harlem being that i'm always here 
And um, I got hired and I was very excited to help change the community and then my cousin had died. My cousin got shot in um, Texas by uh, an officer, so gun violence. No, tell them what that situation is. So my, my, my cousin was both of Jean and he was shot by a white police officer in Texas. Female. Female police officer in September. It was September 6, 2018. It was the day of my best friend's birthday. And um, I had just been working there for two weeks and I had called Sister Aisha in the morning. I'm like, I, I'm like, I, I was in shock. So I was like, they, I, I think they shot my cousin. Uh, my cousin's dead. And when I came in, it's like, I felt like a participant. I was a worker, but I felt like a participant because I needed help. And I felt my mind going in like such negative spaces, you know. And Sister Aisha had given me such a clear pathway to understand what was going on and how I could work to make sure that this don't happen to anybody ever again. So, so you was the organization for two weeks? Two weeks. I started, a, I started as the hospital responder supervisor. Yeah, hospital responder supervisor when we check in on people that's been shot, stabbed, or beaten in the hospital. So two weeks, that first that first second I told Sister Aisha, she said, uh, okay, well, we're on the way to Texas. I said, what you mean? She said, well, I'm about to buy a, a flight to Texas. And I said, oh my goodness, like, I couldn't believe it. But then the, it, everything was solidified to me when she was the one who counseled my family. She told my family basically not to be involved with certain people because we knew that there was a bigger force, you know, attacking what was going on with my family. So I'll say if it wasn't for Sister Aisha, you know, aside from the job, I wouldn't be able to be here with the type of strong mentality to be able to help our community and to deescalate violence and to give kids resources and you know what with what they don't have so it, it's just been amazing working for street corner resources i've i've never met a organization i've worked for a lot of schools and you know community organizations but i've never met an organization that really goes on the forefront to help kids i'm talking about making sure they go to their appointments, making sure that their school grades are, are tight, making sure that down to home visits, down to who, who they're surrounding, who they're being surrounded by, it, it's just been amazing to be a part of it. So that two weeks, once that happened, you're like, wow, this, this is where I need to be. She made a believer out of me. She made a believer out of me and I knew I was meant to be here. So no one could tell me that, you know, I, I'm not meant to be here. I'm meant to transform kids' lives through that experience. Mm -hmm. And I uphold Botham's name through everything that I do. The other day people asked me, they're like, who do you, who do you see yourself doing this for? I see myself doing this for Botham Jean. That was my, my only male cousin. I was like a brother. Like, my family's very small. We come from the island of St. Lucia. So it wasn't no games when it came to this. And since Aisha made it, made my mentality so free and so clear so that I could stay focused and stay on my mission of, of what God called me to do. So mm -hmm. I stand here as a firm believer in Street Corner Resources, and I'll always support them through all the endeavors. Because I see it's the real work in the community. It's easy to get up in front of a camera, you know, when people are out there and pretend like you're working and you're moving, but we, we're on the clock all the time. Mm -hmm. I answer my phone all the time. I never used to answer my phone. I mm -hmm. answer my phone now. Because I made myself available to people in the community. Since Aisha told me last week, she said, you need to, you need to get good and, and be able. I wasn't feeling too well. She said, the community needs you. And I felt that. I felt that. And I still feel that. It won't ever change. So, uh, <laughs> yeah, so, um, yeah, so I, I like that. I like to explain to the um, audience the togetherness. Mm -hmm. The unity is it, very important. It That's is. in, in any is. any uh, uh, fraction. It is very important. Like for instance, not not change the subject. Subject is all go aligned with it. Mm -hmm. Like I'm a Laker fan, and they've been in the news for like the past couple of weeks about their organization right. not to be, being dysfunctional. Mm. The people, you know, it's just not organized. Not together. They're not together, right. and they feel it's falling apart. Mm. It's not the same thing like for us with. with, with this team we have with this company and the same with your team. And what she was saying about, 
you know, how you made her feel mm -hmm. as you being a leader. It's important as being a leader, you have to make the people who you with believe in what you're doing and do things the right way. You just can't do things your way and, mm -hmm. and you have to understand the temperature of the people, the people who you work with. <coughs> it ain't your way the highway. You have to give a little. A lot. Yeah. <laughs> Plus it's also it's also a thing where it's not to cut you off, right? Mm. It's the fact that it's black people, man. Mm. We go <coughs> the real black people. Right. The Latinos do it, the Caucasians do it, the Asians do it, it's black people. You know, we got to stick together. We got to oh, lift each other up. And, you know, a lot of people mad that Harlem is gentrified and all that. You know, I mean, okay, cool. But we still can ride and still do what we got to do. That's right. It ain't over. No, that's right. It only over if, you, if, you, if you, the fight is over. That's right. We got to keep it pushing. We got to support each other. We got to forgive each other. We got to get each other's back. Like you said, when we, when we were young, you had Miss Green, Miss Jones, mm -hmm. Ms. you know, Miss Cat. We All of them was like, you know, we looked out for the neighborhood. We had programs though. We had, we had a lot of programs. But Lots of programs. A lot of programs. They took the program, had budget cuts. I don't know what mm -hmm. governor or what mayor came through and did all that. Mm -hmm. I believe it was uh, what's the dude name? Um, Juliana. That's down with uh, that's Trump lover. What's his name? Um, Juliana. Mm -hmm. Juliana. Yeah. It took a lot of programs away. So now these kids, are, they forced to come out and have nothing to do, nowhere to go. So when they they do, they go in the street and they get in trouble or they get high. Mm -hmm. You know, we had the, we had the PAL on Twenty Third mm -hmm. Street. You know, we had Boys of Yesteryear, we had Men in Sync. Each we, one, teach each one, teach one. Harlem Prep. All, all, all yeah, we had all of these different places to go to get something done. You know, that, to get involved until we got tired and we went home. So now we forced to, or you as a community leader, it should be more of that, but to step up and say, you know, I care about my community and I want to make a difference. Mm -hmm. You know, but it's black people though. Yeah. It's us. You know, it, time and time again, it's us. It's like, dang, you know, we got we got to step up. Like the big one, three nine is our platform is for people striving for success. Mm. You don't have to be on TV. You could be from the street. You could just came out of prison. Mm -hmm. it, you should have to have a story. Mm -hmm. You have to have a story. And you have to be working. And then we try to get you on the show. That's what we do. That's our giving back to the community. That's this right. is what we do. No, that's you great. know, when that's I first great. met you. I met you with, with Cordell Clear. Exactly. And we were coming from right. standing on uh, the principal along with State Senator Brian Benjamin yep. uh, in front of Bank of America mm -hmm. because Bank of, we were protesting that. Yep. Bank of America was invested in private prisons. They were financing them mm -hmm. and still are. And, and uh, not just the private prison, but they're and they've invested and financed the, some of the places where the children oh, of yeah. immigrant call, parents call are being call held. Call yeah, call up, call up. Mm -hmm. I'd uh, like to uh, speak to Sister Aisha. Peace and blessings, Queen. Peace and blessings. I want to congratulate you on your amazing work. You've done an amazing job in the community. Hats off to you that you're able to do this type of work. Thank you. My, quest, my question to you is, I want to know whether or not did you have any political aspiration? <laughs> Everybody wants to know that. <laughs> yeah, we well, used to know in this time, we need good people like you in office. All right, so let me just say this. Um, you know, it's very hard when uh, children are dying to not be political. It's just, it's, this is political. Um, because there, there are political processes that happen that create the environment and the temperament and the place and the way for violence to happen. We know that because that's the way that the prisons upstate stay full. So that in itself is political. Now, do I have the aspiration to run for public office? Um, everybody else says yes. And I'm going to say that I really, at this time, want to make sure that um, the program, the organization that I've started, have uh, some roots and is anchored strongly, and that I have young people who can help to run it in my absence if I choose to run. So I'll just say that, that I'm, I'm not in a place where I want to abandon the work that I've started. I think that I need to do more to anchor it. Of course, there are a whole host of other issues that are impacting young people where violence is concerned. So I've been working on some prison reform issues 
and um, educational issues because our children are going to prison from school and um, from having small fights that turn into a big deal and they criminalize uh, our children first and that, that's how the prisons are being full. So much so that people that are running state prisons are now complaining because state prisons are being closed and, and it impacts their economy. So the work is, is political. So I'm already political. Mm -hmm. They don't like to see me coming. <laughs> well, but, I know um, that uh, your Cure, uh, uh, Cure the Violence program has gotten a lot of attention from the governor and also Mayor de Blasio. Absolutely. And I know that Governor uh, Cuomo actually solicited your um, help in um, the, uh, the bills as right. far Creating as Creating uh, the uh, strongest gun laws. gun laws in the country. And that right. was that was and before money. So, uh, so I guess my question to you to that is is that the current laws that are actually on the books, do you think that they need to be strengthened or do you think that they are really addressing some of your feedback that you provided to incorporate into the bill? Mm, okay. So I'll tell you, I got that call um, with questions from the governor's office. It was... Uh, from his second, first in command beyond himself. And uh, at, at that time it was Liz Glazier and it was uh, folks Christmas Eve, I think it was, or the day before Christmas Eve. It was snowing and raining and I was outside and they said the governor uh, wants to get some input from you. So at that time, you know, we ain't had no money or nothing. I thought folks was playing around. I was like, oh, okay, yeah, right. And you know, I made some joke and they said, There's, no, the governor really wants input. And so I was grateful uh, to be able to have a voice in, in uh, helping to create some of the strongest gun laws in the country. But those gun laws have to be applicable to the communities that are affected by gun violence. And so there are some things within that that do not necessarily apply because uh, in urban communities, guns are not bought legally. So if the gun is not bought legally, a background check doesn't happen. Background check happened on the street corner. You check who you're buying the gun from. You make sure it's not a setup. You put it in a paper bag. You roll off. That's how that go. No names exchanged, nothing, just a few dollars. So I think when we talk about gun laws, and I'm grateful for the laws that we have. I want to say that again. But most of those laws apply when you are buying legal guns. Our issue in places like Harlem and Chicago and Detroit and Los Angeles and Crenshaw and places like that it means we have to deal with closing the gun, what they call the gun show loophole. The gun show loophole means I can go to Georgia or Alabama or um, you know maybe Kentucky or Iowa and go to a gun show that's like a flea market. As a matter of fact, when I first went to college, I went into a flea market and they had a table packed full of guns. And you could just buy the gun, and basically you didn't even have to have ID, and not much of that has, has changed. You can go into a gun show and buy a gun. So what we have to look at is, and, and uh, the governor support, supported this in the law, that we have to look at how do we close the gun show loophole so Day Day and them can't go down south and fill the trunk up with guns and come back and sell them to kids who can't think past go to the 13 or 14 but have a few dollars to buy a gun. So we just recently had a 15-year-old murder. My understanding is that was by another kid. How do kids get guns? They made, they're made available on street corners and hallways and alleyways and sometimes outside in, in back of the school and things like that. So the laws that we need to look at is how do we have impact with those who are selling illegal guns and in particular to children. There has to be some leverage there. And, um, and so that's, that's another place where, where we have to look. So I will continue to use my voice. Um, I was in Albany not long ago, and I presented on a panel on mental health, but I had to talk about how guns are impacting the mental health of young people and video games are doing the same thing. And parents not providing oversight in communities, losing oversight of their communities. So um, it's all political, it's all political. Well, I have one last question. Okay. And my last question to that, it, my last question is, is when we talk about guns, I mean, there's a lot of emphasis on, you know, the kids getting guns, adults actually buying them at gun shows. But I don't think that there's ever been any real conversation about the bullets that go into guns. Oh. 
And I think that, you know what, I, and my personal feeling is, is if you charge, as Chris Rock said one time, if you charge $50,000 for a bullet, guess what? You don't have to worry about shooting a gun. Right, absolutely. And there is, um, you may not have heard a lot of talk about it, but there is a, a bill that's still waiting to become law. I supported that bill, um, along with a whole host of other political uh, folk. I'm not going to try to name them all, but um, for those that are interested, you can go to, um, I think it's congress.gov, and put in gun violence bills that are waiting to become law, and you could easily um, find them. And one is, it's called micro-stamping. So we've been pushing a bill on micro-stamping for a very, very long time. What micro-stamping is, is that when you purchase bullets, that there will be a stamp on it that identifies it, a serial number that identifies the bullet. And it means Very that you good. have to show um, ID, you have to have a valid address, you have to show where those, you know, you have to be able to tell where those bullets are going to be housed and that it be housed, you sign an affidavit that says it will be housed uh, separate from the gun. And so there's a whole host of things with micro stamping. It's not just the stamp on the bullet, but there is responsibility around the storage of the gun and the bullet. Um, that bill, because of the NRA, that's the National Rifle Association, has not been passed, along with a whole host, a long list of bills, and that's what bills are, are written to become law. So while it's waiting, it's called a bill. Once the, that legislation is that it, the, it's passed, it becomes law. And so there are a whole host of suggestions, bills, proposals, bills, waiting to become law that will help right. stop some of what we see. But they have not been pushed forth because the National Rifle Association pays for these political, so-called political people, uh, I understand, including Trump, uh, for their for them to run for office and to continue to support uh, the NRA in having control where guns and bullets and and that kind of laws are concerned. So we have to understand it's not just easy uh, to push these things through. There's a whole power that be that's called the NRA that that stands in the way of that. And so sometimes. Uh, running for office, it's a great thing, but sometimes, uh, you know, there used to be a, a, a book, I know they made a movie, but sometimes you have to be the spook who sat by the door, the one they didn't think would know. You understand? Everybody can't be at the front uh, of the table. Sometimes you need some people that know kind of in the background. So well, you are, you are a leader, and I just, again, want to thank you and congratulate you on the work that you're doing and look forward to your future and all of your aspirations um, going forward. So if you run for office, you got my vote. All right, now. Yeah. Thank, thank you, you so much. Thank you. Thank you for having her on. I mean, you, you have some amazing guests. So you guys have a good evening. Thank, thank you. Thank I appreciate you. it. Thank you. So, can you tell everybody what's going on? One second. One second. I'm, yeah. so, I'm sorry. Let me just add, I just want to ask one question. Mm -hmm. So we also researched that um, John Jay Community, um, community uh, John Jay Co um, Criminal College had wrote an article stating that you guys had diminished crime in two neighborhoods. Oh, and which, which two neighborhoods was that? That's just fantastic. Which two okay, I'm not sure that? when that article was written, but I'll tell you what we've done in the, in the confines of the 32nd Precinct area, where we have a catchment area for the last, this is uh, beginning to be three years. Mm -hmm. So in Harlem, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm happy to say in the area that is our catchment area. So when you get a catchment, the catchment is the area where most of the crime has taken place over the last five years. Mm -hmm. So at the time of the issuance of the contract, Mm -hmm. to do the work, you're getting the hard, what they call the hardest area. So where, where triggers are being pulled, where people have died, where people have been shot. And so our area is, the hardest area is 139th, 140th. I live in this community. Mm -hmm. That's my block, 139. Yeah, yeah. so see, <laughs> so we walked into four, four, uh, four murders and four other shootings at the beginning of the contract. Mm -hmm. We have a thousand and sixty nine days. Sixty nine days, you can figure out how many, that's like almost three years mm -hmm. close to it, uh, with no homicide. Yeah, that's amazing. And, yeah. Especially that John Jay Criminal Justice College picked that up mm -hmm. and published that stating that the cure of violence, your organization has diminished crime in two neighborhoods. Like that's so important. That means that that has to have been like 
overly like successful like right as far as helping young people progress and helping them just be better people and especially with the jobs because the job that's another thing that's important it's mm -hmm. hard for people to find jobs especially on their own young people because they're so pushed out to keep doing other things than concentrating on their dreams and working so that that's that was amazing absolutely and i have to say um for cure violence we're part of the crisis management system but we, we, our model is the Cure Violence model, and you can find that model all across the country. And um, I think one of the unique things with Street Corner Resources is that we dare to be uh, different sometimes, and we, we do what's necessary. We do what's necessary. So I, I really love my team and the work of my team. Thank you. Um, tell everybody where you can find you at, the sure. links and stuff like that. Okay, great. Um, you can find us on the gram at Street Corner Res, on Facebook at Street Corner Res. Um, our telephone number is 212-694-8759. Um, and we all I can't go to myself. Boy, my, my, I have two phones. They, <laughs> they go off all day, all night. And sometimes today I was on the phone with uh, the state assemblywoman in the governor's office at the same time. I said, I got to stop one of these phones. But anyway... It's all good. Um, I just want to want to let people know, though, that we do have legal aid services. Those services are free to the community. If there's anyone who's in crisis or trauma and you need counseling, you don't have to have had someone who died from gun violence. That most of the people in our community has has suffered from some kind of trauma, one way or the other. We have a mental wellness counselor. He's a credible clinician. Comes from our community. Looks like us and understands the culture and provides uh, counseling. We have young people that work in our summer and and winter program, AGVYEP. It's the Anti-Gun Violence Youth Employment Program, and those young people are with us um, almost every single day, and we do a whole host of activities, uh, personal development. Um, we help them to, to get to graduation and a whole host of other things. We have two music studios where young people create beats and music, and we don't use negative language when we do that. And again, the Peace Cafe, the last Friday of every month, mm -hmm. and that's at 233 West 140th Street, uh, on the lower level, and so uh, we'll be there this Friday on the 31st, but if you don't catch us then, then you can catch us any Friday at the, uh, the last Friday of every month. And we also have the Hospital Responder Program where we respond to any violent, vicious act, beating, shooting at the hospital to make sure that there's no uh, retaliation, and last, uh, but not definitely not the least thing, is that we occupy. And so often when there are brutal beatings, or stabbings, we show up where violence has occurred and we occupy that space informing and educating the community, engaging people who have issues with their children, and we just try to, to be the best help that we could possibly be. Wow, I think you, that you, I, you I, I sleep? Yeah. No, I need to sleep. You working, that's good. Though. We working, but no, I, I, we try. No, nah, that's we good. Try. Um, can you tell everybody what podcast show you're on right now? Um, well, ours is not a no. podcast. Oh, no. right here, right here. Um, you know, I'm so used to yeah. promoting ours. I'm so sorry. But, you know, I, I, want, I really want to say I'm so happy to be here. Yeah. And, and I'm grateful for the work that you all are doing, giving people an opportunity to hear people who are doing different.